Welcome back, everybody. Playing you some Yoshiki without you. We're back with another episode of Say Anything with Big Papa. Usually we start out with some pretty, uh, maybe some metal. Some death metal, black metal, take your pick metal. Uh, maybe some misfits. But this is a very special episode. We won't be talking about one topic in particular, but... There's a reason why we uh, started this off with uh, Yoshiki, and I will tell you why in a second. But I am joined once again with my very good friend, uh, Big Papa. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. So I think that uh, I'm, I'm really excited to get back on here. I promise I've not been dodging you at all. Uh, this podcast has been pretty popular in, in certain circles. I mean, I think that it's the uh, it's one of the podcasts that gets... Like the most, like on a consistent basis, as far as like not a single episode is concerned. Um, I think we're we're being pretty successful here, uh, and uh, even if we're not, I enjoyed like kind of doing these episodes with you. It's been a while, but that means we have a lot of content, and uh, maybe what we should start doing is every two weeks do a show instead of like every week or, or something. But a lot of things uh, happened. I was in New York Comic Con. I was you know going to weddings, moving, changing jobs, all that stuff. Uh, but we're back. I got some time, and I'm excited for you to be here again. You were moving in. Uh, wait, you were moving in October? No, I was like moving around. I'm sorry, I'm not moving. Oh. Uh, I'm still in like my, uh, my my current situation, uh, which is fine. Um, it costs you know, Bella Vega. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, there, there's there's that, but. Dude, on my way here, uh, I it, we're kind of delayed because I had to jump my car because it was like cold and like my battery's like corroded as f. And you're gonna tell me I'm stupid for letting it get to that point. Um, but yeah, it's it. Hopefully, it's fine now, and hopefully things can go well uh, tomorrow. But while I was at the place I was at, the That's establishment I was at, you something. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Your battery's not going to work in the morning. <laughs> Don't tell me that. It's true. In fact, if you go outside right now and try and start it, it's not going to start. Mark my words. So, like, when I tried starting it, it wasn't even like it was dead. Like, it wouldn't, the car, it wasn't like usual where I turned the key and it just doesn't start. Like, everything was going shung, 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 shung. And, like, the, the lights and the electricity was like, yeah, you're, you're, you're getting a fallen cell. It's very common and, uh, it's very common in very cold temperatures if your battery isn't you know totally up to par and so what's going to happen is like i said after this podcast <laughs> go outside try and start your car i guarantee you it's not going to start uh so is the solution getting a new battery oh yeah okay yeah if i mean I, battery, I think it's going to get there anyway battery is done i mean if it was the summer it would be okay it might work for a couple more months but with that cold it ain't happening man dude nothing is nothing about the cold is good nothing it's good for Russians. I mean, even then, like, I don't know. If, I guess. I mean, I guess it's in their blood. I don't, I don't know. I and mean, that was probably a pretty horrible accent. But I was at the place I was at. They had a TV. And they had Anthony Bourdain on there, um, whose job I want. If there's one man in the world who I am super jealous of, it is Anthony Bourdain. All he's doing is he's just good. And I know that he had, like, kind of like a rough life like, kind of going on. And uh, I think that you would actually... He's almost like your spirit animal. Like I feel like he's like the final form that you want to be at some point. But he's just going around, bouging it up with all these like amazing chefs with amazing life experiences, um, and he's just traveling the world, eating food, talking about their culture, and just kind of making it so an artistic kind of feast for the eyes. That every time I see it, I'm like, I am so happy about the world that I live in right now. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I like Anthony Bourdain. I haven't seen too much of his show, but the funny thing is, is anytime I see him, it's usually being like, Shane, you gotta watch this, and sending me clips of shit, you know? And uh, I find myself to agree with a lot of the things he does. I like him a lot. He reminds me of me. I don't know. I do. No, I, I like, if there's one friend that Anthony Bourdain reminds me of, it is you. <laughs> like, I feel like you two would oh, it's, you love know, each has, other. He, he has that kind of personality that I... It's kind of like, I guess I could use this as an example. Everybody who knows me knows that I sleep on the floor. I sleep on a traditional Japanese futon mattress on the floor. Mm -hmm. It is hard as a rock. It is cheap as hell, but I love it. Um, and many people are like, oh, you have you know savings and money and all that sort of stuff. Won't you buy a real bed? Or, oh, won't you sleep in a real bed? 
because I don't care. I'll sleep on the floor. Or like Thanksgiving, you know, there's no room at the table. I don't give a shit. I'll sit on the floor and eat. Doesn't make me any more or less of a person, you know. Even if I made two million dollars, I guarantee you, I'd still sleep on the goddamn floor. You know. I mean, it's your thing. Like some things just can't be bred out of you once they're in there. You know. It's just, it's just who I am. Uh, by the way, speaking of like floors and stuff, right. I mean uh, beds and everything. Uh, I, I, how, if I have like a wife or something, right? Like, is it? possible or a house or whatever is it possible to have like a legit master's bed master bedroom uh and have a bed that is on the floor because i love it i like i can't i i if i could be in a low rider bed for the rest of my life i would do it are you talking about just having a why wouldn't it be possible i mean i don't know it just seems like every master bedroom like there's space in between the floor and the bed but i hate that now like i love being low to the ground i love it yeah, it's, I, a lot, it's a lot better, and it allows you to utilize the space around you in a far more efficient manner. Yeah, yeah, but you know. getting back, yeah, getting back to like the Anthony Bourdain thing, like he was. Um, anytime he goes to Japan, it's like a ten out of ten episode, right? Right. Um, and he's just he was talking to this chef of a Japanese uh, restaurant, I think, called Masa, and this is why I wanted to bring it up to you. And it's the most expensive restaurant in North America. Yeah, it's in uh, it's in New York, actually, is it not? Yeah, and, yeah, and it's like in a hotel. Wow, I'm so glad. I'm surprised you know that. Yeah, um, in a hotel. It only has room for shit, maybe five people, and uh, the only menu is a tasting menu. It's about what four or five hundred bucks. So is it omakase then? Yes, that is okay. my choice. That's it. Now, a question. I mean, you might know this. Um, if you're a legit Japanese restaurant, is it? always only omakase if you're like a master sushi chef yes i wouldn't okay. say i wouldn't say it totally and completely yes but i'd say that that's what people really want yeah no i mean i think that if you if you if you legit enjoy sushi and i'm not trying to knock americans or friends that i have or anything but if you are legit into sushi like an omakase is probably something you should strive for your entire life uh you know anytime you go into a sushi restaurant and when you eat sushi like i think in japan for those who don't know like so if you're trying to eat legit sushi like if, if it matters to you that it's traditional or something you, oftentimes you're not going to see um the rice on the outside or you're not going to see you know you're not going to see these like crazy like well, dragon are, dancer rolls it's all no, there are no rolls it's not about because whenever i eat sushi out i eat nigiri yeah so it's always nigiri right yeah, I always specifically eat nigiri myself. The the and once again, it's about simplicity. I love simplicity because simplicity is so so hard to it, it's really hard to achieve perfection with simplicity, you know what I mean? Because with nigiri all you have is the piece of fish and the rice. Mm -hmm. That means that for it to be outstanding there's no tricks. There's no nothing. It, only the freshest ingredients will do. Only the best rice will do. Well, and even the best cuts. Yeah, and you don't you don't see like the micromanagement to like what level it is. Like you need to go, I think, what seven years before you can even handle the rice. Yeah, seven a, years of rice washing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then you know, there's the they they get it down to a science in terms of, like the time they massage, like you know, the octopus, or maybe they. Um, a lot of it is also like, um, the, the time it takes. So the reason why you're like so close to the sushi chef is because the time that it takes, um, to prepare it and give it to you, it would change if they like, say, walked across the room yeah. to, to give it to you. Yeah. They're really, really picky about it. It's kind of uh, like, honestly, like I've been trying to figure out how to cook the best chicken thigh now. For probably <laughs> about two years. <laughs> yeah. I think I almost got it. But it long story short, it takes me about an hour and ten minutes. Yeah, well there you go. I'd like I'd like to see this uh I'd like you to see you tape yourself doing this, you know, like like Big Papa's chicken thighs or whatever. There's not too much involved. There's a lot of me getting shit housed and sitting <laughs> in the background with a timer, but that's about it. <laughs> Uh, singing never gonna give you up and throwing beer cans around no no but uh <laughs> that was funny because at that at that uh at that party man i was trashed and everybody <laughs> thought that video was hilarious uh yeah no it 
I forgot how funny it was. That was um, your idea. That was your idea. You're like, <laughs> man, you should like chug beer, do whippets, and sing Rick Astley. And I'm like, I'll do it. Sir, I have a master's in public health. Do, do not t- do not tell me that I was condoning you doing that kind of stuff. Well, it wasn't condoning. It was <laughs> There's nothing wrong with suggesting. <laughs> People are supposed to do things. People tell them to. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, like so he's he's showing, you know, this guy how he's and they and they talked they they um talked about Kaiseki, which I w- had the pleasure of having in Kyoto, which is like it can change week to week, uh, depending on the season and the ingredients and the plates that you have, and uh, it was just super beautiful. Um, how he does it, it just every time I watch his show, I just I just want to clap at the screen. But the reason why I bring this up is because you and I. Uh, are going to be going to New York sometime soon uh, to witness something that is Japanese, right? Yes, we are going to go see Yoshiki at uh, Carnegie Hall. And for those of people who don't know who Yoshiki is? Yoshiki is the drummer and leader of the band X Japan uh, and has done a bunch of stuff that nobody knows about. Yeah, no, I mean, he's he's one of those guys that you look at and you're like, that guy's like a true artist, he's you know? Dude, I mean, Stan Lee made a comic book for him. Oh, really? Yeah, didn't know that, did you? No, I didn't. Oh. I met Stan Lee. I met Stan Lee this, uh, uh, last month, actually. Did you also know that uh, Yoshiki did the uh, film score for Life of Pi? Really? Didn't know that, did you? No, I didn't. I wanted to ask your, uh, ask your opinion on something. Um, do you... So Gene Simmons said that if X Japan were an American band, they'd be like one of the biggest acts ever. What do you think about that? If it was the right time and place, yes, because there were the hair metal scene and various. The thing about X Japan is it's not just dumbed down hair metal; it's really technical music. It's fantastic. Um, I would say that the hair metal scene and the power metal scene back in the day. You had a 50-50. You had 50% of the people were like, oh, they look so cool and blah, blah, blah. They just didn't get it. But then the other 50% of the people really liked the bands because of the just really great uh, musicianship and work, uh, the song work, you know? So I think that if X Japan, right time, right place in America, I think he's right. Um, do you think that they would have been – okay, let me – let me give you some bands, and you tell me if you think that they could have surpassed them if they were an American or even British band uh, at the time. Because I think that their look could have worked in the time. Because you had bands, hair metal bands, Poison, Twisted Sister, like all these people who were kind of mm. like that. But I mean, they they kind of when I look at those bands, like I don't necessarily think that there's substance to the music. Like when I see X Japan, I'm like, this is art. Right. Like they, like like they're like he Yoshiki's not not doing this to you know bank a paycheck or anything. Like I feel like. These lyrics, uh, the vision, it was something that was spoken to him on an artistic level, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, so, okay, Queen. Queen, uh, let's see, a lot of the bands that you're going to list off, there's no way that they would have been big in America to begin with, because America isn't necessarily very good at producing massive bands, especially during the time period we're talking about, because Americans just really don't give a shit about music. Uh, and let's just move forward with that. For instance, everybody's like, oh, Jimi Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix, American icon, American icon. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he tried to have a career in America. Nobody gave a shit about him. He literally had to move to England, get big in Europe, and then everybody in America was like, oh, Jimi Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix, he's American. Blah, 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 blah. Wait, oh, we- I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, I mean, America's not like a bunch of the bands that you're mentioning. Would they have worked out in America? No, because America doesn't tend to produce great stuff. Americans produce great stuff, but in terms of music, they generally don't produce it in America. Well, I'm going to try to, like, there are some American art uh, music forms that I think are are American that I absolutely love, like um, the blues. I love the blues. Um, And then I don't know if you would consider, like, slow jams, like R&B slow jams is... Did that originate here? I don't know, like R and B or yeah, you know. Um, but anyway, so like Yashiki, um, what was the deal with him and his father again? Uh, you, know, you know what I'm talking about? He never really talks about. It. It's never really mentioned mentioned specifically as much as his father just kind of killed himself. 
Yeah, and I think that he he said something about it in his documentary with like We Are X or something like that, where something about his father and like from oh, you know what it was? He was pissed off that his father like died. Did his father kill himself? You said? Yeah, his father killed himself. He did killed himself, and Taji killed himself. But like Taji was a complete and total massive alcoholic with a lot of issues, so it's not really very surprising on that end. But I mean, still it. I mean, it does suck. Yeah, no, absolutely, it does. Um, but he said, like, instead of, like, punching things and getting into, like, uh, fights and drugs and everything, he decided to bang drums. Right. Dude. And, yeah, and that's that's where he be, he learned how to play the drums. And then I don't know what made him want to get into, like, the piano. Maybe he just found a love for music. Well, he was already, he never, he'd been, he started out as a classical musician because that's, you know, he was a kid and had him do piano lessons and stuff. Only way, the, the funny thing is the, the ex Japan stuff, none of it was classical at all. But uh, you can definitely you can definitely see a classical influence, right? Right? I'm, right. I'm saying in the beginning, none of it was classical at all until one of the producers was like, hey, you want to try and add some piano in a song? I think it was Alive, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. And you know, she was like, should we really do that? And he's like, yeah, why not? So they started adding in classical elements because, well, he already knew how to do it anyway. And uh, it turned out to be a big, uh, a big hit. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Japan is. Uh, if it wasn't for X Japan, Luna C wouldn't be around. And uh, in my opinion, if you haven't heard Luna C, go listen to every single Luna C album. Damn it. So how how many of the songs would you say like giving a, just giving a random percentage number? Um, you don't need to be correct here. Uh, would you would you say like Yushiki had his hands on in terms of like extra Japan songs? <laughs> all of them. Yeah, so like all of them were kind of like composed. I mean, you're 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 branching on ninety five percent. Okay. Okay. And but but did the other ma- band members like have a have a say in it or? Oh, of course. Okay. I know that the, I know I know that there's people who uh uh are big fans of X Japan. And they think that Yoshiki is all knowing and God and everything, but I, I don't believe that Yoshiki sat down and wrote all those guitar solos and all that work. I really don't. Of course, Hida and Pata had to have a part in it because you you can't you can't cover that much ground. That's impossible. As a artist yourself, or as a um... I mean, you definitely have an artistic mind, but as a guitar player, musician yourself, um, how hard is it to take like a form of music or like learning how to play a certain, like say, power chord? And I'm sorry if I'm ignorant towards the terminology, but how hard is it to take like a, like you're playing music a certain way and then improvising? Um, and turning it into something completely different. It depends on what kind of musician you are. Okay. I started out being the kind of guy who would agonize and write and write and write, like on something until I felt it was perfect. But then, then I really got into improvisation because, in my mind, I was like, "Well, if you can just hit record and go, and in one take it's done, then you're the man." Mm-hmm. So uh, I actually did an album uh, called Transient Arcology, uh, where every single track on the record it was hit record, play done that's it every mm-hmm. single song was improvised i think that's that's probably the the height of what i became as a musician before i quit very proud of that one good yeah i mean like you're definitely a guy like i you you can tell you can just tell when somebody's an artist doing something because when when you like made something like all the stuff that you made for your band um, back in the day, like you could tell there was a ton of like, like thought process going into it, you know? Oh, big. Yeah. Like there were layers. There was, there was a lot of stuff that had to be taken into account, you know, big time because you don't want to, what's the point if it doesn't have a good amount of thought behind it. it, It's kind of like the, like I said before, I've never been a fan of music for just music's sake. Yeah. No. Well, did you want? Did you want to maybe tell the audience? I mean, no. how you how you have like a deeper connection with with music or no? 
I mean, I could, but I don't know that I can explain it. Like, I, I don't know. I just have a very overreactive mind. I'm always thinking about five things at once. So when you hear music, like, what happens to you? When I hear music, I can imagine a good five things at once. For instance, the reason why I love Luna C so much is because the just the beautiful guitar work, it reminds me of, let's say, imagine if you could take thousands of wine glasses break them up into crystal, throw them off a building, and backlight it with RGB LEDs over a waterfall. Like you see that? Yeah. Wow. That I mean, that's got to be beautiful. I mean, is it? Like, is it something that you enjoy? It's definitely something I enjoy. Uh, and whenever I, you know, and I always had a thought about music where, like, you know, they're like, oh, music transcends all. It's kind of art. Art in general transcends everything. Uh, you know, whenever people say stupid shit to me like what do you listen to that it's not in english i'm like okay asshole listen here when you walk into a uh, a museum right and you look at let's say a salvador dali piece are you like man i can't understand this painting because salvador dali he was from spain no well that's not what a, that's not what a clock looks like you know right it, it's when you when you listen to an instrumental piece are you like, man, I'm British. I can't understand this piece because this guy's Russian. No, it, it doesn't work like that. Music and art is universal because it's purely just simply manufactured and processed emotion. It's like a play. It's like a movie. It is a engineered experience. It is like, uh, you know, you, you can't go out and shoot somebody uh, because you'll go to jail for a very long time or... You can't eat your neighbor slowly over a period of a month, but surely you can go and watch a film of it. It's basically an engineered experience. Yeah, no. I, That's I, how I always looked at music when I was writing it. You know, it's like that Ramstein song, Neville, you know? I was mm -hmm. like, man, that really reminds me of the ocean, mistiness, and very sultry sort of attitude. This, that. I looked up, I looked up this, the translation. It's exactly what I thought it was. I have no idea what the hell he's talking about. But the idea that you can create atmosphere and that you can manufacture emotion and uh, situations so heavily with music alone, nothing else, uh, to me was always such an interesting idea. Yeah, no, absolutely. And have you ever, because um, the way the way that this uh, concert that we're going to is going to be, it's going to be like he's kind of, I guess, at a solo piano and then he's got the um, Japanese orchestra behind him. Have you ever been to a concert where it was like just instrumental or anything? No. I've gotten pretty close and that I've seen Ingve like a bunch of times and various other things, but I mean I mean and Steve Vai of course. So I mean I've gotten pretty close to an instrumental concert, but I've never I've never really been to one. Yeah, well, dude, I'm I'm so excited to go with you, man. Like I the second I saw this, right? I'm going to behave myself. I'd like to tell you. I'm not <laughs> Dude, it's right fine. Now. And I'm not, dude, I'm not going to be a stickler. So for people who don't know, like, Jay and I kind of, you know, we kind of think that we, we, we lead somewhat, I guess, different lives or something. We don't, you know. Oh boy, do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, dude, I, a lot of what I'm doing here is because like, I just want to, you know, do something awesome for you and just see the look on your face like when you are gonna see yoshiki or yoshiki just play oh that's not that's live. not why you want to do it if you if that were the case why don't you pay for it i mean i also <laughs> I, I mean it's not cheap but i mean i like new york and i want to see yoshiki and it's like i i said like yeah i could go by myself but there's no other person i would want to see it with except you and i just feel like bringing right. you would just enhance the experience and i also want to dude i want to eat sushi with you in manhattan and everything I'd like to somehow get a flask and put some liquor in it and try and get on one of the tallest buildings I can and look down and take a sip from it and be like, man, what a waste. And then <laughs> kind of walk off. <laughs> what? what? You think they'll let you do that like on the top of like the um, Freedom Tower or uh, Empire State Building? They're not going to know about it. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. And you're like in a business suit, right, while you're doing it? That's pretty much what I'd say. What a <laughs> Like in a business suit. Beautiful waste. How about like you have a briefcase and like in the briefcase is just the flask. Yeah, <laughs> it's the flask. Maybe some sake. Yeah, it's like what a waste. What a beautiful waste. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> it's so true, dude. When you see various things, there's something uh, I've been obsessed with for quite some time now, and that for some odd reason, human beings, human beings are terrifying, horrible creatures, and that anything inherently self-destructive, people love. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know? and I will never, I will never understand why. Yeah, right. Right. I mean, I, who knows, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to be a, a great time. And then, like, you know, speaking of New York, I mean, we have a, we have a president now from New York and I don't want to, <laughs> my, my, uh, smooth, right. Smooth transition. Um, my, I don't, I don't want to get into politics on any of my podcasts at all. Like I'm not going to talk about like, yeah. Yeah. Like my views or anything like that. But I think that it would be very interesting to uh, talk to someone like you, for example, who has different viewpoints that are not necessarily canned or, um, you yeah. know, just kind of generic and everything. Um, so we have a new president who not a lot of people thought was going to win, who had very kind I, of extreme. I, I'm going to come out and say I believed it to be impossible. OK, why is that? I believed it to be impossible because I thought, well, the way that I predicted it, I predicted, I said, OK, the Johnson guy, he'll get three percent of the vote. So I was right about that. I believed that what was going to happen is that Trump would win the popular vote and that Hillary would win the electoral college vote. Yeah. That is what I thought wholeheartedly was going to happen. As we know, the exact opposite happened. And when I saw that, I was like, there's no way. That's yeah. that's just that that's capital right there. That's uh nobody saw that coming. I can tell you that. Come out of nowhere, RKO. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I was I was sitting there. Oh yeah, the the night of the uh, the voting, I, I was sitting in my computer with like a twelve pack, and like Brenton's like passed out in bed, and I'm just sitting there chugging beers, watching as the votes tally up, blasting personal Jesus on repeat. <laughs> like <laughs> your own purse, yeah. that one. <laughs> Reach out and touch faith. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, oh. Honey, why don't you come to bed? I'll be there in a second, Bunny. Just wait. I'm watching the world burn. <laughs> okay, so I mean, what what do you think went into getting him elected? Like, what what do you think that this says about America? I think that what it says about America is I think that it it's it's something that I've talked about a lot. The country has moved in a way that. A large percentage, a large percentage of Americans are in the shit, man. Yeah. Um, you and I, for instance, we make pretty good money. Uh, and well, me, for instance, I happen to make it from lots of hard work and time. You did also. I've just got a GED. I just happen to fall into it. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. the problem is, is I did that in Virginia. You can't do that in Pennsylvania. You can't do that uh, in Carolina. You can't do that in South Carolina. You can't do that, you know. And what happened is, is you, you know, like, for instance, do you remember the term bachelor pad? Yeah. Yeah, that used to exist. It doesn't anymore because existing now is so insanely expensive to the point mm -hmm. where it is nearly impossible. If you get sick, you probably have to declare bankruptcy. If you get in a car crash, you're going to have massive problems. Uh, anything you do, if you go to school, once again, massive debt. Anything you do nowadays will destroy and cripple you unless it is handled with the finesse of a fine-tuned Oxford butler. Yeah, I, You know, I didn't expect you to say – I didn't know what you were going to say, but, I, I, you know, I think that what you're saying really is, uh, you know, it's definitely – I think there's a lot of truth to what you just said, honestly. I mean, like you look at you look at me. I mean, I I feel, I feel like I'm very fortunate to be where I am professionally, um, and you know, even the other stuff that I get uh, as well. Um, but I can't really enjoy it because I decided to go to college for two years that I'm you know that I'm paying for you know in like a master's program, right? Oh, you're paying. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, and you're paying. No, it, it's true, man. And uh, I know. It, it put me in the good situation I'm in, but it's like it almost might as well I might as well not be because it's not like I get to see or enjoy any of that, you know, because I have to worry about paying it off and constantly for the for multiple years. 
Well, so what, what happened is, if you're going to ask me what happened, I, I'd say what happened is, is what you see on TV <laughs> and what you see on Facebook creates an illusion of how people really think and feel. TV and Facebook and the media is not how people think and feel. It is a small amount of people. If you were to watch nothing but YouTube, you would think that everybody who's 20-something can mystically have enough money to travel <laughs> the world and do things like Casey Neistat all day. It doesn't work like that. Maybe perhaps 5% of America is like that. Once you leave Virginia, you really start to realize what the Commonwealth of Virginia means. That's uh, absolutely true. There is only, there is only, you know, the good life, that sort of thing. To me, it's probably New York, uh, Virginia, California, your big hubs. Other than that, the whole place is kind of destitute. For instance, over 50% of Pennsylvania is on some type of government assistance. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to live. So what happened is, is back just, what, 15 years ago, you could make a career out of working at a grocery store. You yes. can make a career out of many, many, many things. Um, and you'd be all right. You could do that job. You could afford a house. You could afford a car. You wouldn't, nothing amazing would happen. But it's not like today where you need to do batshit insane things just to be able to survive. Because in the area where I live, which isn't even incredible, to be known as middle class, one person, not both, just one, you need to make $75,000. Yeah. Okay, so if you ask me, sorry for what's about to come up, that's fucking insane. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of tell people like what, so what what's like what's like the closest city center to where you are? Like it's not like Manhattan, right? Right, right. That that that's that's in Virginia, man. That's in Fredericksburg, <laughs> Fredericksburg. An hour and 20 minutes from DC in traffic about 4 hours. But anyway, so it's like <laughs> You know, I don't even live in anything amazing, but, um, you know, it didn't used to be like that. It used to be that you could make a career and make an honest living and be comfortable just almost doing really anything, you know, uh, not like working at KB Toys or something, but uh, you, you could be okay. Well, now it's to the point where you're not okay. The only way you're okay is if you either work crappy jobs like that because now they're shitty jobs they're not good jobs at all what used to be a good job is nothing um you either work those jobs and you work like you work your ass off you destroy yourself you work 70 80 hour work weeks and if you're alone and you have a roommate and you don't even live where you work because nobody lives where they work or you know see option two uh you work one single good job but you still work a 60 hour work week <laughs> and you, you can actually survive without the roommate. Take your pick. It's a great fun, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, my, um, my friend's uh, mom, right? Uh, put his dad through a semester of college working at a pencil factory. Yeah. Uh, nowadays it's like you, you can't, there are only so many things you can do that, will give you enough money to do anything. And I think the large amount of Trump supporters probably don't even like Trump that much as much as they like Trump's message. For instance, I will just put my thoughts out on the matter, not very political or anything like that. But for instance, I don't like Trump at all. I hate him. Uh, do I think he's a better option than Hillary? Yes. Do I like Hillary? God, no, I don't like Hillary. Do I like her message? Yes, I love her message and Bernie Sanders' message. These are great things, but the problem is, is that they are, they are in effect impossible to do. Um, it, it's purely impossible when you have a country with as much debt as we have and things are so expensive as they already are, how are you going, how are you going to foot the bill on things like free college, uh, better health care? Uh, the health care system is totally – that I – uh, dude, it's ridiculous. Well, because you can't you can't hope for it to work in America. It would make no sense for it to work in America because in America, healthcare is for profit. You yeah. can't have something be for profit and have it be affordable. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. It's very good insight.
which is why when people are like, oh, Obamacare is horrible. Yeah, it's horrible. So is health insurance. When the health system is for profit, it in no way, shape, or form will ever be affordable because they are allowed to charge whatever they like. I'm some pretty deep and awesome stuff that you just said. I, I you know, I, I think that it would a lot of stuff that you said that has a lot of truth to it um, as well. Now, how how much of the voting for Trump do you think had to do with just people are over? Uh, party politics and traditional um, candidate or traditional politicians? Honestly, it's about 90% of it. And also people, in my opinion, are probably getting sick of the, uh, people, are, people are probably getting sick of the social justice warrior, politically correct bullshit. Yeah. Because I'm, I myself, am, I'm sick of it. Like I see, you know, people like gay people, for instance, I myself flaming. Uh, <laughs> you know, I see people... <laughs> <laughs> I see gay people saying things like, you know, oh my God, now that Trump is president, I'm afraid for my safety. I'm afraid for my rights. And I'm like, listen, man, just because some guy is in a white painted building, probably thousands of miles away from you, it doesn't mean a damn about your personal safety. Your personal safety doesn't change. People at the end of the day, they're going to hate you or love you or whatever because you're gay. The fact that that guy's president, it doesn't change anything. And if anything, all of them lobbying around, acting as if they're afraid, that doesn't do very much for the advancement of gay people in general at all. In fact, if you really wanted to be proactive about it and you were gay, now is the time, if anything, to step up times 50,000 and tell people that you really don't care what they think and you're going to continue to move forward and be treated as uh, any other person as opposed to cowering and being like, I'm so afraid, you know, nothing ever gets fixed that way. Yeah, I hear you, man. And I mean, like when I, I also, when you said like the riots and stuff like that, like, um, the thing is, man, like he's, he's the one who got elected. Right. And I, I don't want him to fail. He's the, you know, cause if he fails, it's bad for, you know, the country, right? Like, I don't want, I don't wish him to fail. I don't want him to be like, you know, um oh let's make him crappy so the next guy can come in because i've become like kind of just i guess so over the whole politics becoming team sports right like it's it's like bears packers it's like you know if one if one team's ahead like everyone else is just completely like oh, oh no well, our team well see think about this because here's the way i think of it i think if he fails it's a great thing i think if he does good it's a great thing but if he fails it's also a great thing why is that because it causes reform it changes ideas. It challenges ideas. And then next time people will be like, nope, we're not doing that shit again. Yeah. Kind of, I mean, I. It's like the whole thing with Obamacare. Ever, it first off started, oh, this is a great idea. But then you do it, and it turns out it's far more expensive. Prices have gone up on everything far worse than ever. And so it's horrible. It's turned out to be horrible. But that's a great thing because now. Now you see things going on, like people being like, wait a second, why are they charging $600 for the EpiPen? Wait a second, why do I have to pay them $250 a month and I can't use my health insurance until I pay them six grand? Well, before, that didn't happen. Now it is happening, and people are becoming very angry. And that's good, because if it didn't happen and it didn't suck, you wouldn't produce any change. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. Um it, it's gonna be, you know, I it, it's it's very it's gonna be very interesting, and I I hope that the next four years are are positive, and you know, oh, buddy, gonna, we're gonna get to see some really great stuff. You want to talk about a fireworks show? <laughs> well, I can tell you, like, I think stand up comedians like looked at it as like they were like, oh my god, we have so much material now for the next four years or something. <laughs> oh, this is gonna be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to talk about an interesting time to be alive, this is it. Yeah, no, and um, oh boy, oh boy, I think that this is the election where people are going to look back on it and they're going to say, like, from this point on, like, the politicians that ran for office and everything uh, prior to it are completely different than after after it, you know? Right. It's uh, the, the the amount of change that's going on within the country in the time that we've grown up uh, is just unparalleled. You, especially the language being used. Like when it says it will also allow children the age of 26 to be on their parents' health insurance. Yes, children the age 
of 26 to be on their parents what are children the age of 26 because things have changed so much that the idea of anybody having a family or a house or being financially off having savings anything is completely and totally it's not even possible it's an insane rarity until maybe perhaps your mid 30s or some unless you get insanely lucky <laughs> yeah i mean i think there's a lot of truth to what you just said where before where before you could maybe get kicked out at 18 work your ass off and own a shitty house somewhere or something and be able to afford to feed yourself but unfortunately it's not the case anymore yeah but hey man uh i think that it's about time it's about that time where we wrap this up and everything um oh this is a great episode i didn't even seem like 40 minutes that we've been <laughs> talking or whatever but i just want to say man i'm so excited to see you in new york uh and everything and uh thanks again right. for being patient with me and being on this podcast yeah man we're gonna go down there we're gonna gonna Go see some really great stuff. Have a couple drinks. Not too many. <laughs> not too many drinks. Well, you'll you'll have a lot of drinks, and I'll have I'll drink a lot of water, tea, milk. No, I'm not gonna have a lot. I'm just gonna have a few, and yeah, yeah. Uh, have a couple drinks. And uh, I'm gonna bring my own cigarettes because I don't feel like being stabbed in the face by the tax man. And uh, <laughs> I'm gonna carry you around, and you're gonna act as my personal guard, and people are gonna think I'm a celebrity because you're buff as shit. That's right. I'm gonna go into the, your 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 crowding, Mister Mister uh, Papa. That's right. <laughs> oh, Mister Papa, guy needs to breathe. So. Um, if people want to catch you on like your YouTube, where you talk about like a lot of corals and aquarium stuff, uh, what would you? Where would they find you? Actually, the channel's name is just Big Papa. I want <laughs> to change like it. I want to change it to Big Papa Salt though, but I can't ever. Dude, I can't figure out how. Uh, you go into um. You told me all this. I said, <laughs> well, you know, just Google it. You'll find it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of very interesting videos there. And if you're intrigued at like just seeing, you know, if you, you talk, it. talk about corals and salt, t salt water tanks and everything and aquarium maintenance and everything, go, go to his channel. Uh, if you just, I guess if you just type in big Papa aquariums or big Papa corals or whatever, big Papa salt, big Papa something, yeah, yeah. you know, you can just link it on J train media. If you're subscribed to the channel, people can just go and look at your subscribe subscriptions and find me out on there. Basically, I'll post a link. if you like watching lengthy fascist rants about saltwater aquariums, <laughs> or like to see what a uh, car full of gallon water jugs looks like, yeah, distilled water. Yeah, man. <laughs> and of course, you're still talking about cannibalism. Oh, cannibalism, it's, dude! It's been an obsession of mine. Where can I say? <laughs> Green inferno over there. Um. All right, dude. Thanks again for uh, being on uh, my show. And uh, anyone want to ask questions or whatever or discuss about the show, comment below and like and subscribe to my channel. All right, everyone. Have a great night. Peace.